This video accompanies lesson 18 in your lab manual, blood vessels of the upper limbs, and by the end of this you should be comfortable tracing a drop of arterial blood from the heart to the digits on both the right and the left sides, and venous blood from the digits back to the heart via both the deep and the superficial routes. Now, As before, we are going to be using the flat man circulatory model and the large arm model to identify these vessels. Unlike the lower limbs, the arterial routes of the upper limbs are not the same on the left and the right sides. So let's go ahead and begin all the way back at the heart in order to follow the blood in these routes. As I'm sure you recall, oxygenated blood is going to be pumped out of the left ventricle into the ascending aorta, which is then going to curve off towards the left side of the body and become the aortic arch. There are three main arterial branches that are going to emerge from the aortic arch. The first is the brachiocephalic trunk, the second is the left common carotid artery, and the third is the left subclavian artery. If we are blood that is heading towards the right limb, we are going to get there by going into blood vessel number one, the brachiocephalic trunk. Brachiocephalic trunk is fairly short, but it very quickly splits into the right common carotid, which you can see here that then heads up the neck, and the right subclavian, which is then going to continue on arm, on up to the arm. After that right subclavian passes over the first rib, it is going to become the axillary artery. Now you can't exactly see the first rib on this model because it's hidden by this blood vessel, but we can approximate where that would be. And I've put that yellow line to indicate approximately where the name change would occur in that blood vessel. The axillary artery is then going to become the brachial artery after it passes the lower margin of the teres major muscle. Now obviously the muscles aren't present on this model of the circulatory system, but we can approximate the location of that as well to see where that name change would be. So just as we saw in the lower limb, we're going to have multiple name changes occurring here with the initial arterial flow without there actually being any splitting at that point. Now on the left side, the vast majority of this is going to look the same, only we are going to get there out of blood vessel number three, which is going to be the left subclavian artery. So we're going to go straight from the aortic arch into the left subclavian artery, then that is going to become the axillary artery after passing that first rib, which will then become the brachial artery after passing the teres major muscle. I do want to quickly draw your attention to the fact that we are not specifying the difference between left and right blood vessels except for the subclavians in this case. As a general rule, you do not have to specify left or right with a blood vessel if it is symmetrical on both sides or a mirror image on both sides. As long as the blood vessel has the same origin and destination on both sides of the body, you don't have to specify that. However, for the subclavians, on the right side that blood originates from the brachiocephalic trunk and leaves the blood vessel through the axillary artery. But on the left side, while it does leave through the axillary artery, it arrives from the aortic arch. So there's different blood flow into those blood vessels. Therefore, we do need to specify right subclavian and left subclavian. As we continue to follow this blood into the forearm, I'm going to remove part of the model just and just focus on the arm so we can more easily label these features. So near the coronoid fossa of that humerus, the brachial artery is going to split into the radial artery and into the ulnar artery. Now, as you might expect, these arteries are going to follow the radius and the ulna distally all the way to the wrist. At the wrist, these arteries are going to anastomose to form a superficial palmar arch and a deep palmar arch. Although both arteries supply both arches, the radial is the primary contributor to the deep palmar arch and the ulnar artery is the main contributor to the superficial palmar arch. However, on this specific model, it's a little ambiguous about their um, identifications because you don't have palm, two palmar arches. It only includes a single palmar arch in this image. Both arches are going to supply blood to the hand and to those digital arteries. Now for the blood supply going back, blood flow from the hand to, um, back through the deep veins is very similar to the arterial flow, almost identical even in nomencl nomenclature. We're going to have digital veins that are running along the digital arteries and that blood is going to flow into the superficial and deep palmar venous arches. That blood is then going to flow into both of those arches are then going to drain into the radial veins and the ulnar veins, which are the venae comitantes. If you recall those paired veins that run alongside those companion arteries, which you can see right here. 
This model does not include any of the venous veins in the model, so you have to imagine that those blood vessels, those veins would be located there. After crossing the elbow, the radial veins and the ulnar veins are going to merge to form those brachial veins and then continue along parallel to the brachial artery. So again, none of those are present there because this model restricts its imagery to the uh, superficial venous flow, and so that's what we're going to continue uh, consider next. We also have a set of superficial venous vessels in the upper limbs, just as we did in the lower limbs. The dorsal venous network empties into both the cephalic vein on the lateral side of the arm and the basilic vein on the medial side of the arm. You can't actually see the dorsal venous network because we are obviously looking at the palmar or the anterior side of the hand. But you can imagine where that would be and then you can see how these veins start to emerge on the side, um, on both the lateral and the medial sides. So the basilic vein is going to travel along that ulnar side of the forearm and continue on up into the upper arm. And then eventually it's going to merge with the brachial vein to form the axillary vein. The cephalic vein on the other side is going to travel alongside the radius on the forearm and then continue on that same side of the upper arm where it will eventually merge with the axillary vein to form the subclavian vein. Now on the anterior side, we're also going to see one additional small blood vessel, and that is the median cubital vein. This is a blood vessel which is able to conduct blood from the cephalic into the basilic. So blood is not necessarily going to travel through the cephalic all the way up. It can move across to the basilic part way up. Now on each side of the body, the subclavian vein is going to merge with the internal jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. The left and the right brachiocephalic veins are then going to merge to form the vena cava. Now notice how none of these veins have left or right prefixes because they are the same on the left and, um, and the right side. So again, just kind of following that entire route back, we can either go all the way up the cephalic side of the arm and end up at the subclavian. We can come on up the basilic side of the arm, ending up in the axillary, or we can start in the cephalic vein, cross on over the, through the median cubital vein into the basilic, and then end up at the axillary vein. So now we're going to take a few minutes to identify some of the blood vessels we just finished talking about on our large arm model. So let's come all the way up here to the proximal part of the shoulder. And you, hopefully you would be able to deduce that at this point, if we're looking at an artery in this region, uh, that we would have to be looking at the axillary artery. We've gone past the first rib already, but we haven't yet passed the teres major. Once this artery gets past the teres major, now officially the name would change. So as we're continuing it to follow down here, and it's kind of bundled up with some of these nerves, but we would be able to see underneath here is where the brachial artery would be. Next, we're going to expect to find the brachial artery split into the radial and the ulnar artery. So I'm going to go ahead and take off some of these muscles so that we can see that. Okay, so now that we've taken off those muscles and we've reoriented a bit, we can get a much better view of where the brachial artery is going to split into the radial artery and the ulnar artery. And now let's follow both of those further down into the forearm all the way to the hand. So we've got our radial artery who's going to head off towards this lateral side of the arm. I'm going to continue on down next to that radial nerve and eventually down here at the wrist is we're going to see another split where part of that blood is going to be draining into the deep palmar arch while we're also going to have some of it coming to the superficial palmar arch. On the medial side again we can follow that ulnar artery and as it comes all the way down the forearm and now it becomes a neurovascular bundle with the ulnar nerve. And as we continue taking that down to the palm, we can see that artery comma right around here, cross over the wrist, and then we can also see where it is making its contribution to that superficial palmar arch. And then coming off of the superficial palmar arch, we have several different digital arteries that are visible here. There aren't any veins that are present on this model, but everywhere that we've looked at where there's going to be an artery, you would expect to find either a single companion vein associated with it um, in terms of, as we would see up at the 
axillary artery, but along the brachial arteries and then the ulnar artery and the radial artery, we would find two paired veins that are forming a vena comitans along with those arteries.